Right, good morning everyone and welcome to the first quarterly meeting for the Let's Do Digital Clinical Informatics Hub. Um, joining uh, today from the Digital Summer School, I'm in York University, very nice university built on the, one of the rivers around here. This is the inside of the conference building that we're in. Lots of geese and rabbits around here, quite interesting. Um, and there's been quite a lot of talk about digital innovation around here and how we can, um, you know, innovate, share, but there's a lot of silos of uh, clinical inf uh, innovation, uh, digital innovation around here. Uh, and so I, I would like to talk about how we could collaborate further. Now the agenda for today, um, if you could just put your role, um, your title, your name and digital input that you have in the chat, please. We haven't really got time today, uh, I think, for uh, going through, around the room to talk. Uh, we'll see how we go through the uh, presentation today and so on. I'd like to talk today about the feedback from the Let's Talk digital uh, event uh, conference that we had in March of this year, the Clinical Informatics Hub and an update on innovation in the Southwest. So those that were fortunate to be at the event, either virtually or in person, we had the Let's, uh, the inaugural Let's Talk uh, digital conference in March this year. Um, and we talked about lots of great digital innovation happening around the Southwest and further afield, uh, how people manage to do these things, how they manage to get past the barriers, um, the cultural barriers, the digital barriers of actually implementing these things. We spoke about the elephant in the room and also, um, Zod, the zone of comfortable debate, and very much something that I believe we should always do. Now, the Let's Talk Digital Conference, we had 170, oh, sorry, over 170 people register for the event. Uh, over 70 people joined virtually and around six people joined in person. Feedback was really positive. People very much enjoyed it. Um, and very interesting, um, we've had people from England, Wales, Scotland, and even as far away as Bristol join us on the day uh, virtually uh, and got some fantastic feedback from them as well. Of course, there was some you know, constructive feedback, which actually was very much appreciated about how we could improve the conference for next year. So I think uh, having shorter presentation sessions with more time for Q&A is a must. I, I felt like we didn't have much time at all for people to ask questions. And there were some very exciting questions that we had from the floor during the conference. We need much better audio and visual uh, recordings uh, for the live and also um, for the recordings for the YouTube. And we're thinking of getting an audio visual team to help improve that quality and improve how people hear uh, on the virtual side of things. There was a lot of feedback, unfortunately, which is something that happens with teams. So we need to work through that. Uh, we needed greater networking time. Uh, a lot of the time I had to ask people to stop talking, come join the conference, but um, yeah, we definitely, I felt bad about that. And I feel like we just need longer time for people to talk and, and, and network and collaborate and probably have name badges as I've got today at our conference uh, here at the Digital Summer School in York. And don't hold during the Cheltenham races. Um, I think that's very important. So now we want to do this again. We want to do the conference again. So we have booked it in for the 18th of May, 2023. Now, to the studio view there, we realize that actually that's just a Thursday, it's not a Tuesday, it's on that calendar, but that's just a picture I found online uh, of a different date, I've just changed the date of the year, sorry. And so it's the 18th of May, but it's a Thursday, not a Tuesday. Um, and we'll send out um, formal invites to that later, but put it into your diaries now so you don't book it, anything else in that slot because we just want everyone that's here to come and um, join in. Right, we're admitting a few more, few more people, good. Um, let's do digital clinical informatics stuff. So it's a spin-off from the let's talk digital. It's like, well, let's talk about it at the conference and let's do it afterwards and between them and actually work together, collaborate a movement for digital innovation throughout the Southwest and further afield who anyone, you know, throughout the whole globe who wants to get involved with what we're doing, please do, because, you know, we're all trying to so solve the same problems at the end of the day. And the way we want to do this is to continue work on projects, three to four weekly show and tell of current projects within the hub. Um, and quarterly hub review meetings as there's one today. And ideas for what we're gonna build from anyone, doctors, nurses, midwives, secretaries, porters, patients, for example, anyone. So I have to manually let everyone 
join in, so I have to click on that. So I did a mock-up of what the sort of submission of idea page could look like. Um, I've already presented uh, this before at the SWAG Cancer Alliance meeting, but I thought it's important for everyone else outside of that meeting to see this sort of stuff as well, where it's anyone, patient, you know, clinician, admin person can submit an idea. Any idea, it doesn't matter how crazy they are, because we're going to rank them. And, uh, you know, there's going to be some crazy ideas, there's going to be some fantastic ideas, some ideas that we've never thought about. And, we, you know, we can publish them online and we'll rank them using criteria that we've set. Now, these are just ideas. That don't hold me to any of these ideas and how, how much they score. But these are ideas about how you could actually score um, or rank the um, ideas and then the highest ranking one would be built first and we work down that list. Of course, we've only got so much money, we've only got so much time. We have to sort of, um, you know, work on one thing at a time, but we'll, you know, we'll say why we're doing it that way. We'll, you know, we tell people why we're not doing their pet project at the moment it's because, you know, of the way things are scored you know, and limitations like that. But we want to be very open and clear about how we do things. Now, how will success be measured? Um, access perform, access, access performance and improvement, uh, full audit, speed of process, staff feedback, patient feedback, measures of safety, and error rates as well. Sharing far and wide. We're already doing this. Um, me, Joe, and Nick, my two uh, computer science students, are talking webinars. Uh, blogging about what we're doing and how we want to help collaborate, network, share, improve patient management, improve workflows, reduce workloads. And we want it all in the open. We want to open source standards and learnings and very much want academic, clinical and industrial involvement as well. And as a lot of you probably know, there is um, the Let's Do Digital websites or web pages on the SWAG Cancer Alliance website. Whether we have a, a separate Let's Do Digital website at some point, that's very possible. Of course, we have to think about the funding of that. That's why we quickly put it onto the SWAG website. So at least we had somewhere for people to see about the blogs that we had and the bios and the posters and the actual events as well in March. But you know that's something to be decided. And if we have time today, we can discuss that as well. Because the, 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 the let's do digital movement, and that's how I want to phrase it, is not about the Southwest as itself. It's about collaborating far and wide. And, you know, we've all got the same problems. We all should be working together to solve them together. And, you know, we could build something in Gloucestershire or, you know, around Bristol. Someone builds something and then shares it to another site. Another site builds something else. We, we'll bring it back and so on. And, you know, we can save money this way within the NHS as well, doing things like that. Um, operational guiding principles, user-centered design, privacy and security at the foremost, interoperability, openness, as I've said, uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Architectural principles aligns with the NHS architectural strategies, as you can see on the link below. They very much want to do open source, internet first, modern browsers, best cybersecurity standards, separation of layers, um, sort of front end, back end, um, part of interoperability and user experience, accessibility and reduce the digital divide. Don't just make fantastic digital systems that run on just the most recent, uh, recent smartphones. You need to think about patients that only have like a Nokia brick and, you know, can they get details or information from your system. Maybe you could just do SMS. Maybe you could have a chatbot, like an Alexa chatbot to talk to them instead and call them, call them up on their house phone if that's all they have. Of course, a lot of people that have um, uh, smartphones now. So the, the number of uh, people in that divide is getting less and less, but you still need to think about it because inequality in the NHS is still, or in health and in, in society is still there. Now we want to get academia very much happening throughout the Southwest. So we want placement students, MC students and PhD students involved in all our projects. We've got two students, as I said, at the moment, I wanna get another two next year, come September to continue the lung cancer pathway that I've been working on with Nick and Joe. And we want clinicians uh, more involved with clinical informatics, nurses, doctors, midwives, pharmacists, uh, and all, the, all those um, uh, uh, AHPs. Apprentices as well. I think that'd be amazing having a two-year apprentice to continue the knowledge um, of, um, of the things we're building and training up the clinical and computer science workforce that's needed in the NHS. Working together. So to achieve these aims, we need the digital team and the clinical teams to work together in, in a joined up manner. And how do we do this? Well, it's not an easy thing. It's been a problem for many people for a long time, but 
as Peter Drucker said, cold treat strategy for breakfast. It's not about the technology per se. It's about winning hearts and minds and getting people to align with your strategy, thinking along the same lines and actually working with you rather than against you, getting the top level, middle level and frontline staff all working together. Funding, it's one of the big bottlenecks, definitely. But um, the, uh, the cultural change is one of them as well. And, you know, we can actually fund this via grants, NSS bursaries, uh, it could be self-supported uh, via doing software as a service, training and implementation, maintenance of um, let's do digital solutions. Now, updates. Updates from the Digital Health for Long-Term Plan National Priorities and Cancer Genomics, such as Lynch Syndrome. There's the NHS app meeting that we had this morning at eight, and there's uh, what they have called a, a in integration box where people can actually build within the app new functionality, which I very much want to get involved with in doing a patient portal for lung cancer. How we communicate with patients and the public involvement, uh, regional projects, two week waits, targeted lung health checks, and Joe Channing, one of my students, has just been offered a job in Oxford University uh, as a new computer science out there analyst. That's amazing news. Just two days ago, he got the job. Um, so in terms of other things going on more academic, we've got the, uh, we've had the early career research event on the 24th of June, 2022. And uh, we've got a video from Martin Baswana uh, about nanoswarms. But if our talk is gonna be uh, ending in seven minutes, apparently um, we might not have time to go through that. And I apologize. This is why I shouldn't have gone to Zoom. I should have gone to Teams, Never mind. Um, also the University of Gloucestershire um, we are launching the MSc in Health Tech, there's an MSc in Digital Leadership, there's potential new lectureships for speakers from the Let's Talk Digital Conference, uh, and also there's the uh, Oxford University, uh, the potentially joining up with work, and they already are actually on the lung cancer pathway, and there's also potential collaboration with the Thames Valley Cancer Alliance. We got Claire here. Yeah, I'm here, Mark. Ah, oh, fantastic. Now it's your turn to give a three minute quick fire <laughs> overview of my medical record, go. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm Claire working at North Bristol NHS Trust and we're using my medical record for remote um, monitoring of patients on particular um, cancer pathways. We've rolled it out. Um, so yeah, so we rolled it out to a subset of prostate patients at the moment, and we're looking to go to breast and colorectal in due course. We're working out protocols and resources with them. Um, the challenges that we've had with rolling it out is getting CNS's time to work with the cancer support workers who will, the cancer support workers will monitor the patients and the CNS's will oversee that. And that's been proven difficult just carving out that clinical time for the CNSs um, because of other competing clinical demands but just sort of highlighting that's that's important for them to do that. We've also had a few problems with asking the patients to attend a workshop that they need to attend to understand how my medical record works, what we're wanting them to do, things they need to be worried about and to give them information about accessing their results and when may be appropriate for them to do that. But we've had difficulties getting gentlemen to find the time to attend. It's just an hour workshop, but they, they seem to have difficulty doing that. Um, and regarding with the clinical teams, we're trying to arrange resources for patients to have on my medical record so they can get signpost them to information. But that's been quite difficult because teams want to put lots of resources on there. So it's sort of managing expectations of what we can fit within the website that we have. That is perfect. Thank you so much for that. Thank now. You. Next one we have along is uh, Matimba Swama, who unfortunately is at another meeting, so couldn't actually come along, but she's made us a nice little video. Now I'm going to really put my IT um, uh, skills to the test and try and share a video. Hello, my name is Matimba. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol. So sorry I can't be there with you today. I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of my, of my PhD. 
Um, cancer nanomedicine is the medical application of nanotechnologies to treat cancer, uh, which deals with matter at dimensions between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers. So just for context, a red blood cell is about 7,000 nanometers, and 1 nanometer is what a tennis ball is to the Earth. Nanoparticles are nanosized particles that can assist the delivery of chemotherapy drugs to a tumor, and clinical translation of cancer nanomedicines remains low. Uh, approximately 1% of cancer nanomedicines deliver drug to a solid tumor. A systems approach, such as in silico modeling um, of cancer nanomedicines across scales and transport barriers, can be used for selecting nanoparticles that optimize treatment outcomes. Despite this, the healthcare sector is underusing digital technologies. And one of the key reasons for this is there, there isn't um, any governance or, or framework in place yet. So can you regulate something that is not defined? Nanoparticles, um, they can be organic or, or inorganic and can assist in the delivery of chemotherapy, as I've previously mentioned. Uh, nanobots are nano-sized entities that can control their motion and interactions with the environment. This allows us to send nanoparticles to difficult to reach areas. Um, in research and development, micro-robotics are moving into animal studies, and the FDA granted humanitarian use device designation to an LA-based company for the treatment of Dandy Walker syndrome last, last year. Um, nanoswarms build on a large number of agents, so nanoparticles or, or nanobots that interact with each other, for example, communication, or their environment to achieve a cooperative task. For example, find and target a tumour, coordinate delivery of a drug, make decisions about a tumour and its treatment, optimise nanoparticle delivery. And what we're looking at is what will the first in human clinical trial of uh, these nanoswarms look like, and and what are the the legal, regulatory, design, ethical considerations that we need to look into? Um, the key question here is, what will the future look like? And here is a is a vignette of a patient that goes to see his doctor, and. His doctor is uploading his information to a, a virtual avatar of the patient and then is able to test by running loads of different simulations um, on, on the patient, like different doses, and find the right medication for the patient. So the patient can pick up the prescription, take it home, 3D print it, the nanoswarms deliver chemotherapy to the tumour, eradicate the tumour on the patient, is recovered and is free to go on holiday with his family. There are still loads of things to consider before this, this future could be a reality. Thank you for listening. I was going to talk a bit about the Spirit and Duo work we've been doing, the Lung Cancer Pathway uh, prototype. And I just wanted to bring that up and show that to everyone, what we've got going on with that. It's been some very exciting work. I'm just going to try and keep it to the three minutes as well. I'm going to share my screen again. This is a prototype for Spirit and Doe, which is lung cancer pathway, which is open source and modular, so different disease sites and different trusts can use it. And we have, um, well, we, me, uh, Nick and Joe have been doing all the hard work, but we've been building this uh, prototype and just to quickly show you what we've done. The whole point behind this is automate and digitize the pathway from referral to treatment and all the steps involved. But so this is a to do page. It's got lists of patients that need to be done. You can see the first patient has been locked by Andrew White because he still has it open on his desktop. Um, uh, but if we go to another patient, let's say Marilyn Kelly, they've got a PET CT waiting to be looked at. So you can look at the referral letters, open it up, close it down, see what's happened there. Look at the PET CT. Uh, it's come back saying there's a 47 millimeter abin nodule. And so, well, let's say you, we think they need to have an, an EVAS, which is a camera test into lung state biopsies. You submit that, send it off, it sends all the um, requests to the back end that gets sent. And when actually that's been done and comes back, 
then you can outcome that next stage as well. And wanted to show you also the graphical representation of the pathway. So you can see a list of to do um, things for these patients here, but you can look at them in the same way, but with a graphical representation, there's not much data in here at the moment because we haven't actually addressed the patient much, but what you see, these are days at the top, you would see as uh, things progress, you'd see when different things have happened with different colors. And here you can see that for Stephen, we we're awaiting a referral uh, letter, chest X-ray and CT chest to be outcomed and progress the pathway. Um, and we've also been working very heavily on an MDT function. You can create MDTs, uh, edit them and so on, see the patients within the MDT, click on them and you get uh, this modular page where you can actually, this is just quickly typed in there, but you can um, add in there, um, you know, for surgery and save that. And that's the MDT. If you need to look at uh, previous um, uh, previous uh, reports uh, and requests, they're still there available. If you want to request something during the MDT, that's all available as well. Um, and that's a, just a quick lowdown of what we've been doing with that. So I will stop showing that. Is Andrew on the call? I am, Mark, but this is tough stuff to follow. <laughs> I wish I'd gone first. <laughs> yeah, it's been robotic be nanomedicine and wow. <laughs> yeah, and your stuff is work. amazing. So, uh, yeah. Well, Thank you. <laughs> Next time I'm, I'm first, my... please. Uh, you said you had some slides though, didn't I you? Have. Do you mind if I share my screen? Is that yeah, going to be a problem? Share. Yeah, just uh, there's two projects that I'm working on in Bristol. Um, one is um, using artificial intelligence, which is machine learning, um, to look if we can improve the safety of chemotherapy prescribing. And that's just in the feasibility stage still at the moment. Um, we're working with Plymouth University and we have a PhD student working on it. Um, and our plan is to, um, you know, crack this feasibility stage and, and prepare for a bigger grant and NIHR, either I for I, or there's a lot of money coming out of the AI lab. So hoping that might be a bit more fruitful. Um, so that's one project. We're about to launch a patient survey and being very delayed in doing that, but um, we're almost there and we're going to survey patients in uh, BHOG to see how they feel about AI use, being used in their healthcare, which is really important. Um, and then the other one, which is what I've got the slides on, is um, I launched um, an app for patients with CML with a, a pharmacist from Birmingham earlier this year. We um, have published it at UHBW. Um, it's been a really steep learning curve around intellectual property and um, legal matters, access agreements with other collaborators. Um, we had a grant from Pfizer. Um, we launched, it's really positive at the moment. We've, we've um, secured a research award um, to now be doing some qualitative analysis. So we've just done a questionnaire. We've got lots of constructive feedback to take forward. So we're looking at um, getting funding for further development and maintenance. Um, that's likely to be with Pfizer. But the other really exciting stuff um, that's happened as a consequence is there's been further interest. Um, so uh, Professor Claire Harrison, who um, is a, an international expert in MPN, really would like to do one for MPN patients. So so we've been working with the MPN Society. Um, Cure Leukemia are a charity fund um, mainly in the Midlands who also fund the UK TAP programme. They're really keen to look at ALL patients um, and that was something we wanted to right at the beginning but we actually went for CML so it's another passion of mine so I'm really excited about that one. Um, and that will have a different, very different feel to the my, the my CML app because it's children. We're going to look at other sort of maybe gaming aspects, etc. Um, and then myeloma is also a passion of mine. I'm a prescriber in myeloma, um, myeloma UK and Pfizer. We're trying to work with to move that forward. A um, bit more complex treatments than CML, so will be a real challenge, which is exciting. And also, um, I presented to the UK Myeloma Research Alliance in London, and we're looking to see whether we can maybe even collect patient reported outcome measures in one of the trials, um, because we've got in our app, we've got a symptom and a feelings diary, um, which is very much on the myeloma patient agenda as well. Um, yeah, so that's it from me. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you for that, really succinct. And a fantastic project, don't put yourself down please at all. Uh, I love what you're doing and waiting <laughs> to hear you. more uh, at other meetings. You're navigating this brilliantly, Mark, as well, with all the <laughs> changes. <laughs> it's hard work, I'm getting a sweat here. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, get through it. So yes, uh, that was Andrea Preston talking about my CML. Interesting stuff, honestly, it is. Now, I realise we've got a bit of time for Q&A. We've almost finished the slide deck I've got, so that's good. Um, so prepare your questions, answers, stick your hands up if you've got something to talk about. I'm at the NHS uh, Digital Summer School run by Digital Health. Um, that's an exciting place to be, but there's lots of discussion about digital innovation, collaboration, silo innovation with the NHS, and just not joining things up and actually doing things together for the you know the greater good. And that got us thinking, we need to restart NHS hackathons. Now, what a hackathon is, is a hack day where hackers, basically people, this is the old terminology for someone that programs, but that's been used in movies for someone bad. It's actually someone good when you talk about hackathons and hack days, where you get people that program, you get clinicians, you get patients, you get anyone interested in digital and health together to actually go, people bring projects along, 30 of them that they think would be a great thing to do. You do a little presentation of them, five minutes each, and then you just go and sit down at the table and you join the project you liked. And the end of the day, or end of a weekend, it's a long weekend, you um, get, there's voting and we'll vote for the best presentation. And we want to do this at Gloucester University. Now we're thinking of doing it for January, but I think there's one going to already happen in Cardiff. So we'll probably do it a bit later in 2023, maybe sort of springtime. But I've already got the thumbs up from Gloucester University that we can do it there. That's, so stream one is the hack, hacking part, making the apps. And stream two would be actually people talking about open source, because everything has to be open source now, please. Um, open source and open standards, open learning uh, projects that people have done or are currently doing, and that will be a separate stream where people do presentations and we'll have some hopefully high up senior digital managers coming to actually chair and um, award the best presentation as well. So that should be exciting stuff. We literally just decided that yesterday and we're making going to make it happen sometime next year. Interestingly, we had an NHS hackathon previously in Gloucester in 2017, I just found out. So it's just bringing it back home, isn't it? Anywho. So to summarize, lots going on. Honestly, it's quite exciting um, when, when you put it all together like this. Now, the second thing is, and I'm going to go on about this, though, this might be the wrong audience to actually go on about it. We do need funding for all of this. Where is it coming from is a tough one uh, and always fighting for that extra bit of money, extra bit of staff time to come and do these things. But, you know, at least we should have that opening discussed so we can actually, you know, if someone finds a pot of money that could help someone else, please just, you know, share that knowledge, pay it forwards. We all, all need to work together and make things better for patients and our own, you know, clinical work lives as well. Um, date of the next uh, meeting for the quarterly meeting, probably in October. And Adam, I heard rumours you might want to chair that one. Hopefully you can do better than me for chairing the digital side. I don't know if you're still interested after seeing the, the mess I made. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's difficult um, when you're you're doing it from a conference on a laptop or Wi-Fi. But yeah, absolutely. As long as um, as long as it's not when I'm on leave or something, but that's fine. I've got a, a couple of points in a minute, but I'll come come back to me when you're ready. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I'm almost finished. So um, yes, yeah, so if you've got projects that you want to share far and wide, we'd love to put them onto the Swag uh, Cancer Alliance uh, platform for you know the subsection of Let's Do Digital. As I said before, it'd be nice to have its own website for Let's Do Digital, but for now, for financial reason that it's being um, covered by Swag it doesn't mean Swag is in control of Let's Do Digital and Let's Do Dig uh, Let's Talk Digital. It's just that's where we happen to be, and Swag is very interested in keeping up collaborating with that movement that entity and yeah please roll into your work for these three minute quick fire talks be very exciting to see other people's um ongoing or finished projects and what you've learned and how you can, how other people can take things forwards right um yes and, and also if you want to put in the chat any of your thoughts about how we can make these quick fire one hour sessions just to keep the passion going until the next conference uh, and actually, do you think three minute um, quick fire talks or something else would be useful? Let us know. This is the first time we've done it, uh, as you can see by some of the uh, ropiness of it. But yes, questions from anyone. Adam, I guess you're first because you've already raised. Points. Yeah, it was just it was just to um, get the balance right between stuff that's 
core and already happening and working constructively with our trust in the ICS and then doing side projects or other things which may feed in locally or regionally or nationally. Um, because a lot of stuff that happens gets done because clinicians don't know actually what's happening in the ICS or their own trust. And, and it's very difficult to engage, it's very difficult to communicate stuff. I go to a lot of meetings, both in the trust and in the ICS, where sometimes I'm the only secondary care representation because nobody's got time, nobody's been allocated it. And so you don't get the correct input from clinical staff on the front line. And that's always a problem. So, so projects like this, which engage clinical staff is great. You know, for example, locally, we've got, so we are developing our electronic patient record to be able to do all our clinics and eventually inpatients. We've got Doctor Doctor as a digital patient project, which has been purchased for the ICS, which is a platform which allows video consultations, pre-clinic questionnaires, allowing patients to see their um, appointments and, and request changes, a bit like we were talking about the NHS app this morning. And also eventually they'll see their clinic letters and things on this. So this is a really great platform and it's going to have things like patient initiated follow up and you'll be able to send questionnaires to patients. So a lot of stuff that people may be thinking about doing their own projects are actually going to happen. We're also going with a company called Doppler, I think it is, about the virtual ward stuff. So this is patient monitoring in their own home. So there's going to be um, for patients discharged from hospital or trying to be avoid admission. They'll be they'll have, for example, Bluetooth connected blood pressure machines and uh, ECG machines that they can go home with and they can provide their observations. And then a team in the community will monitor those and then uh, try and manage the patient's heart failure or infections and stop them coming into hospital. So there's loads of exciting stuff that's happening within the ICS and within the trust. And unfortunately, we're not getting clinicians even engaged with those. And so we have to be really a lot, make sure we're aligned so that we're making, getting the best use of our limited resource. So brilliant to do innovative projects and, and try and do other stuff, but also make sure that we're aware what's going on in our regions already, because otherwise we're just doing parallel work and we're wasting money. We already do that. People buy, you know, departments buy something for their department, not realizing that the whole trust is going to buy something that will solve that problem. Um, and I think, the you know, things are really accelerating. It is a very exciting time, but we've really got to engage and make sure that we're all aware of what's happening in our own areas. So that's my plea. And no, and I appreciate the reality check that you always give me, Adam. Um, and it is a balance, isn't it? About it's you know, not stifling innovation, usual. it's doing no, innovation. No, 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 but, but also doing, doing innovation, innovation, but making sure it aligns with everything else. Yeah, and, it, and everyone making, knows about it. And you're not duplicating efforts. But, but innovating within our, what we, you know, it's very innovative using Doctor Doctor and Doppler for virtual wards yep. and my medical record for monitoring. And all this is already funded, but we can't even get these projects supported sufficiently clinically. And, and this is important digital innovation that we've got funding for. So my plea is let's support these things that we're already doing and yeah. make sure we're not reinventing the wheel. No, 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 I fully agree. I fully agree. Um, but the part of the issue with that is communication, isn't it? We're not communicating very well between digital teams, clinical teams, even between those entities. And we need to have it joined up. I've been thinking about in Gloucester to have a newsletter from the digital team, sort of the clinical informatics team saying what's going on, what we're going to do next. Absolutely. You know, uh, from, from, from a sort of a quick understanding point of view, a quick fire thing. We don't have that at the moment. So the only way I know how things that work digitally in, in the trust is because I keep on annoying the digital team and telling me, asking them, how do you do this? How do you do this? What's going on? What's happening next? And I, and I tell them I want to do this, but like you can't because this is our other focus that we need to do at the moment. We're doing inpatients. You want to do outpatients. And again, so da, 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 da. So it's about communication. And I do think that's what I'm trying to do, the do. Let's do digital movement. It's like, let's communicate what's going on. Yes, we shouldn't duplicate work. That's something like, like you're trying to implement, Adam, and so on. Um, anyway, we could go on for a while with that. I yeah. see Claire. That, I know, absolutely. We're trying to communicate. And the last thing is there's also a digital innovation hub being set up by BNSSG. So there's already sort of a lot of other yeah. people trying to get into this space. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we need to sort of collaborate. It can be lots of little network uh, nodes, but we need to collaborate. So the first one with hand up next is Tracy Miles, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, thanks. I'll be very quick. Mine was just an 
an echo of what of, of what Adam has just said. So I'm setting up a couple of digital projects um, in my neck of the woods. And I know Steve Walton has been in touch with you, um, Adam, about the project that we're doing, hoping to do. But the absolute joy to find that the bit of money that Steve and I got, we're, we're, we're part of a, of, a, of a larger group and sort of supporting some work with Macmillan, who have been absolutely brilliant, was to find that Adam was going, actually, I've done that bit. So we don't have to spend the money on that bit. We can actually spend our money on another bit. And I really think you, so echoing what Adam said and actually echoing what you just said, Mark, it's about communication. It's only as I've started to get nerdy that I've seen something beginning with D and it ends with digital and then I'm on it. And that's how we meet people. But we are still not a big enough crowd. We do need to get talking, finding other ways. So I will keep yakking to all of my nurses, midwives and other colleagues, but um, yeah, I just wanted to support what you were both saying. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Tracy. It's good to have as many opinions as we can on this and try and streamline everything we're trying to do and make it work for everyone. Right, uh, Claire, you're next. If you could unmute yourself, please. Yeah, no, so I suppose I just wanted as well just to echo what Adam was saying, working on my medical record. It's just people's expectations of what digital can and can't do with them and getting clinical teams engaged with it, carving out the time for it. Um, yeah, it, it's challenging and, and we have sort of put information in newsletters and things to try and get the communication out there. Um, but there's so much else going on, isn't there? It's yeah, just really echoing. It's tricky. Yeah, and the thing is, I feel like news, well, we need to have this information at, sort of, almost in a central repository for the whole NHS. So you can see actually up north they're doing this one thing, which would be great, you know, even there's local communication but there's also collaborative nationwide collaboration now that's not something you can fix overnight but i think it's something we should strive towards sort of blue sky thinking almost so we um, try to find other trusts that are doing my medical record apart from southampton we have found mm. one up in near liverpool and they've been quite helpful um but yeah you're right we need something central where we can find out other people that are using these systems so we can share knowledge and just understand how we can make them work to the best yeah and i, I know there are some platforms where you could potentially do it like uh, future nhs but i'm not a huge fan of that platform um and I think that's something to be discussed over the you know, coming months or years, like how can we actually make sure people hear what we're doing and we can hear what other people are doing and how can we work together? That's I'm going to repeat that over and over because I think it's really important for saving money, saving lives, saving our sanity, not everyone building their own digital solution like uh, the same thing like Adam was pointing out and so on. Um, any other questions from the floor? We've got um, nine minutes still. Could I ask Shirley, something, like. Mark? Sorry, Andrea. Yeah. Could I ask yeah, something? Yeah, please do. Um, the BNSSG Digital Innovation Hub sounds amazing. I hadn't heard about that coming along. Because um, something I'm right. finding quite challenging to navigate at the minute is I've got all this interest to collaborate further and actually really put the trust on the map because the trust owns the IP of this app and going forward that's kind of the model we would want to work with but it's actually releasing some time for me to do this because the my email app you know a lot of us like you Mark as well a lot of people are just doing that of goodwill in their own time because it's something they're passionate yeah, that, about but that passion but, will run out at some point well yeah and, and and obviously that was one project this is going to be wider so at the moment I'm trying to navigate at the trust you know would they be able to pay for a few hours of my time if this is to be you know, a trust owned thing. I mean, that will, yeah, is still to be determined. But if anybody else has got any experience of, you know, navigating that at their trusts, or is there going to be funding for digital innovation at all? I've, I've spoken to Chris Barrington, who's our um, chief technology officer. Everybody's really supportive, but it's actually finding someone who can pull the purse strings out and do it, which we're, we're still trying to navigate at the moment. But yeah. I suppose it's like pain. funding a specialist nurse. You you've got to say what you know what what in where 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 are we going to improve patient care or save money to make and then you make a business case and apply for it in the usual way. I like your but point. But that's difficult, isn't the, it? Sorry. It is difficult. I'm sorry. not saying it's not difficult. Yeah, the ICS because it would save money, maybe particularly for our trust. But yeah. like globally, they're now getting recognised as you know improving patient care. But that's the problem with all posts. We all can improve with quality, but what they want is either the same or less. 
in yeah. terms of money and it's just you know building these things and paying for app developers and you know because there's bugs that come along you've got to you know maintain that it's not cheap stuff so there's no way I could probably demonstrate it saves money but it would you know it's improving the use of medicines we've had a few cases already where patients have improved their BCR able counts because now they're taking their medicines properly but again that quality just sometimes doesn't relate into business cases that the divisional managers want so really I think the trusts have to want to be innovative and, and I, you know Adam our true two of our four trust values are um, innovation and collaboration which I could say these projects are you know 100% but there's not a pot of money for that really it's, it's an easy pot of money to access yeah, anyway. outside standard research probably not no yeah and, and, and it's sorry, an interesting it's, debate we've been having in uh, the Digital Summer School that there's all this money going to like these big companies, like 360 million to Palantir, just do the data handling where, you know, we could build an open source internally. Why we're doing that, 40 million for other things, uh, big up projects. And, you know, why is the money not being distributed sort of fairly and efficiently? There's an efficiency problem and why is it not coming into innovation? And real, real innovation, you need to technically, like what the companies are doing, the big tech companies, 10 to 20% of your revenue should go towards digital innovation. And I just heard from a trust sort of, uh, um, from someone who's a CCI or a trust, they got 0.4% of their revenues going towards digital. So it's not answering how to fix the problem, but it is a problem <laughs> to acknowledge. Yeah. I, sorry, this is Andrew Frangleton. The, the issue you're facing is that open source isn't free. Open source needs paying somewhere. It may be owned by the NHS, but someone's got to build it and maintain it, look after it, nurture it. And so, so we shouldn't fall into the, the, the thinking that open source means free um, because it doesn't, especially with innovation. No, it's, it's not free at all um, and it never will be free, but it's cheaper much much cheaper one person builds it and then someone else comes along and fixes it up makes it better someone else maintains it and someone else wants they want that and their trust they just ask a company or an nhs body or whatever software house to actually come and install it and maintain it but you're not paying big bucks for something that's been yeah. written previously but 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 you've got to invest in it in the first place someone's got to build that in mm. the first place and that yep. needs someone's got to pay for it because it can't be done in your spare time you know all the time that's not the not way to build much. professional applications yeah it's like yep. uh, jeff hall in in leeds started off making his own electronic patient record for the cancer hospital and that was done just locally and then eventually it was so good that it's been taken up to the whole leads but of course it's now a massive infrastructure with lots of software engineers and support and a proper funding and you know so it's an internally developed company but it's not necessarily cheap well emis the gp system was written by some gps in their garage so, you know, these things do happen from the front line and they should because they understand the problems. I'm not saying you is perfect. Yeah, and Doctor Doctor was started up by a couple of people, you know, and and connecting care, um our our um the app which we have our data on, that's that's a couple of doctors from UHPW. It it can be done, but it's a hard and there's an awful lot of failures on the way. Yeah. Yeah. And innovation has failure rates, you know, ten percent success rate's good. I mean, I used to be a chemist and, you know, a 5% success rate was good. So, you know, it depends what industry you're in. Um, anyway, any other questions or any other points? I mean, this is just a place for discussion. I'm, you know, zone of uncomfortable debate is pretty much what I'm trying to keep going here, that we can talk about these problems and maybe find solutions or maybe not, but, you know, at least express our woes. Sorry, it's Andrew again here. I'm interested, the three projects that you discussed today, um, yeah. I wonder, um, they're all collecting clinical data. So I'm wondering whether they're all using SNOMED coding behind the scenes to preserve that data in a machine computable way, in a way that we can share it in other records in the future. Um, and those fundamental standards that are being set and should be in all NHS applications, innovation or not, should be adopting those fundamental standards. So I wondered whether they were. So I can't talk for the other projects uh, and in terms of the Spirit and Duo Lung Cancer Pathway work or the Cancer Pathway work, um, it's a prototype at the moment. It's not actually connecting to uh, real live patient data. It hopefully will soon. I have a colleague and friend in Oxford, Grant um, Balance, who wants to actually install it in the hematology department there to do um, so, so, so what's it, cancer, uh, lung, uh, 
blood cancer uh, treatment out there. Um, in terms of SNOMED CT, yes, it should be doing that. And that is something in the next stage when we start putting in actual diagnoses and past medical history, definitely some SNOMED CT. There's a fantastic clinician who codes called Mark Wardle in Wales who um, has actually built a, a program that actually integrates to the um, SNOMED CT backend quite nicely. So you can use that nicely as well. You know, the FHIR, HL7 protocols, all those standards we want to use. And that's we've been working with NHS X Innovation Lab in January and February this year just to make sure we align with those standards as well. Um, I would hope, you know, Andrew and Claire would be able to say similar things, um, but definitely I think everyone should try and keep the standards um, everywhere we can. And there are, um, you know, NHS standards are clear standards available. I don't know if Andrew or Claire have anything to add to that. Uh, just to add, actually, ours doesn't collect patient data. This is this app was bespoke for patients' needs and their functionality. So it includes medication adherence. Um, it's got a drug interaction checker. They can put all their results in, but actually, we don't access it at the moment. There's a we we've we've had trouble navigating all the information governance and GDPR issues so our first version is is more for patients of what they want and actually at the time there was quite a lot of concern about patient data and pharma um accessing it but since i think there is a bit of a shift the patients want their data to be used if it can help you know future generations so that's part of what we're going to look at in our post qualitative research when we're doing our focus groups and surveys um because particularly that would be very useful if we're going to put an app in a trial to look at adherence and uh, patient reported outcome measures um, but yeah we're, we're very much in the stage of working it up but we, we wouldn't have snow med code in when it's not that advanced at the moment anything from claire if she's still with us yeah i'm still here so i don't know what snow med coding is i just know that our um, my medical record has been designed and built by Southampton hospital and um, so i assume they've done all what they know yeah mmr will integrate with the eprs and stuff so it'll be coded on the epr Okay, um, unfortunately we're out of time. That was, apart from the sort of IT hiccups, it's funny for an IT session, we still have hiccups. Um, I think that went quite smoothly. And I was quite excited, actually very excited by everything we discussed. I look forward to the next session um, with Adam chairing. We'll hopefully have some other fantastic things going on around the county. I've already got some things I think we can line up. And Thank you very much for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you all at the next quarterly meeting and also, also at the conference. That would be nice face to face. We're doing a hybrid thing again, but if we can come face to face, that'd be fantastic. So thank you very much.